I want to look today at being up close and personal. A couple of weeks ago I was looking at letters from lockdown. Last Sunday and last Tuesday, or the Sunday before last and the Tuesday before last, I was looking at letters from lockdown. And when I looked at those letters, I was talking about the letters that Paul wrote when he was in prison. He was personally locked down, but he was free in his spirit. He was able to pray. He was able to reach out to all of the people that he was connected to all over the then known world, simply by writing letters and by praying for them. And though he was physically caged, his spirit was free. When we looked at those letters, we looked at the letters of Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philemon. And we looked at how the, the people who um, he was writing to were all going through some degree of test or some degree of trouble in some manner or means. And when he writes to them, he gives them advice of, in, in three basic uh, in three basic ways. This is what he, this is basically the advice he gives them. I was saying that they were dangerous dockets cause, documents because some of the things that he was saying, well, do you know what? They weren't great. Some of the things that he was saying were a little bit troubling and if you they'd fall into the hands of the Roman authorities, they might have caused trouble because some of the declarations and the statements he made there would have been seen as incendiary to the Romans. In these letters, he spells out who God is and what he's done for us, who we were and who we now are, and then he goes on to say how we should live now as a result of what God has done for us. He talks about how we should do, how we should live as a result of what God has done. And on the Tuesday night, which was the Tuesday before last, I was looking about how he talks in these letters about how our citizenship is in heaven. And that's kind of where I want to go this morning because I want to talk about what it's going to be like to live up close and personal. This is what he says. He says, above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. You must conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news. And he says, above all, you are citizens of heaven. That when you go around, you live as, you are a representative of, you're an ambassador, as Paul says in Corinthians, of Jesus Christ. And so as a result of that, we have to realize that the way that we live affects the people around us. I like what Jim Wallace, he's an American Christian writer and he's a theologian and the founder of an organization called Sojourners, what he said. He made this statement, I thought it was true. He said, faith is always personal and never private. Faith is always personal to us. It must always be to us personally. It's not a distant religion. It is always a personal connection and a personal relationship with God, but it is never private. People say, oh, well, faith is a private matter. It doesn't need to be in the public. That's not actually true because in the scriptures, there's never a mention of your faith being private. Au contraire, we are supposed to live our faith out loud so that people can see what's going on in our life, to see what Jesus Christ has done for us and to see who we represent and why we live the way that we live. But I want to focus specifically today on the idea that we're all kind of a little bit trapped in our homes. You might be trapped in a mansion. God bless you. I hope you with 500 acres that you can wander. I hope that's you. God bless you if you are. Or you might be trapped in a small apartment somewhere and you may have two or three kids and it can be really, really difficult to live up close and personal like that. The people who will see what we're like the most are the people we live with. They're also the people that we work with. Maybe you'll say this morning, well, I live on my own. I don't have anybody. But you know what? You will soon be emerging again and you'll be connecting with people and you will be getting up close and personal, even if you're socially distanced. They will see what you're like when you're up close and personal to them. And when we look at living what it was like to live up close and personal, Paul begins to write his advice or he begins to write his teaching about how the Christians should live in these circumstances because he was talking about them connecting to each other in fellowship and in church. And remember, most churches were in homes, so they saw each other really up close and personal. And that's what I want to look at this morning. You know, the people that you live at, you know, that you live with, you can love them or they can really get on your nerves. But I have good news for you, not only do they get on your nerves, you get on their nerves too. We're all kind of, especially when we're in lockdown, having to struggle perhaps with living with people who, well, let, let me give you an example. Elm and I like our host to be home to be nice and clean and tidy. And our, our children, well, not so much. And so therefore, sometimes we might have a little bit of tension entering in as a result of, uh, as a result of the way that we're living in that way. Because we're up close and personal, we're seeing each other every day, every day, because we're working and living at home and people are all. He says your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who though being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God 
something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being made as a human, being found in appearance as a man. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of, that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. You know, what does it say? It says he became obedient to death. The, the ancient saint, the 4th century saint, Saint Anastasius said that Jesus was so full of life, he had to borrow death to die. He had to borrow death. He was so full of life. He was made. He was God in his absolute essence and nature. And yet he took the form of man for us. He took that form on for us. He gave up the power and the privileges of heaven for us. To die for us. And that is what Paul says is the example that we should follow. Having a humble heart and a humble attitude to the people that we live with and we work with and the people that we love and the people that we're around and the people that we socialize with or whatever it is that we do. He says that's the attitude that we should have. The same attitude that Jesus had. No, that's not easy. That isn't easy. No, there's some people think, ah, yeah, that's okay. You see, because it, it's easy. It's easy to get on with people when nothing is bothering. It's easy. We all feel good. I like, I like what one writer said when he said this. He said, everyone feels benevolent if nothing happens to be annoying them at the moment. Everyone feels good if you're sitting there in comfort and peace and you're well fed and you don't have any toothache or an earache or a leg ache and there's nothing bothering you. We all feel benevolent. We are all kind of kind and well-meaning in those circumstances. Everyone feels that way when there's nothing particularly bothering us. But the minute you have a toothache or an earache or somebody starts to annoy you or starts asking you for too much, eee! suddenly we can become irritated. Suddenly we can become difficult to live with. Oh, by the way, this is a, a writer I bet you'll never guess. You'll never guess who actually said this. Uh, go on, go on, go on. Yes, you guessed that it was C.S. Lewis and he wrote it in his book, The Problem of Pain. Everyone feels benevolent when there's nothing bother them. That's why if you go out into the countryside and you live alone, let me give you an example. Do you ever see Pope Francis? Pope Francis, he's a lovely guy. He's always smiling at the Papa, Papa Francis. He's a lovely guy. But do you know why? He has no children. He has no wife. He has no responsibilities. Not in the home sense. I know he has lots of responsibilities. Or you look at the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is always smiling. He's always happy. You wonder, hmm, I wonder is it because he lives in luxury and there's nothing particularly bothering him at the time. It's a lot more different. When you see people going around with young kids, I see, like, I see me and Elma sometimes, we go to restaurants. We, uh, we, a restaurant, for those of you who don't know, a restaurant was a place where you could go out and you could eat together. You could eat with other people, even sitting close to you. It was amazing. It's a long time ago. Maybe sometime in the future they might reintroduce them. But these things called restaurants. But we were sitting in a restaurant recently, about a few weeks ago, and the people behind us had two small kids and the two small kids were just constantly kicking up and crying and looking for a bottle and turning over plates and knocking drinks and Elma and I were sitting there and we couldn't help but smile we were smiling at the kids just looking at the kids smiling and I'd say the parents are going what kind of creepy weirdos are sitting in the next booth but we were just smiling at the kids because we know what it's like and we were also sitting there smiling at the kids going aren't I glad I'm not sitting in that booth and I'm sitting in this booth because I have less pressure and less hassle I remember once saying to Elma when, when our boys were small we had three small boys full of energy turning over plates and spilling spaghetti oh when we were in restaurants I said that's it I'm never going to a restaurant again I couldn't take the stress it was so hard to deal with but you know what everyone feels benevolent when there's nothing bothering you at the moment but when there's something bothering you that's when you have to dig deeper and find something else in you and that's what the Christian message tells us to do here's what Paul writes to the Colossians he said he says to them since God chose you to be the holy people he loves you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy with kindness with humility with gentleness and with patience. I love the way he starts off that, and this is something I really want to get across to you this morning. As since God chose you, you are a chosen person. God has chosen to put his identity on you. God has chosen you. You were picked 
You were selected by God for a purpose. I want to get that across. It's really important. You're not a random accident. There are no random accidents in the kingdom of God. The people of God were chosen. They were picked. They were selected. I was in Tesco recently. Well, before it all closed. I was in Tesco recently and I was looking at cuts of meat. And there's, the, there's just the regular kind of, yeah, Tesco, whatever. I'm just, and then over here, there's the Tesco Select. And it's just that little bit better. It's the kind of slightly upper cut. And it's that selection is what he's talking about here. God chose you to be his people. He chose you to carry his name. You know when you were a kid and you were lining up for soccer or whatever? For me, I was always the last to be picked altogether. Oh. I was always last to be picked. Why? Because I was ambidextrous. I had two left feet. Couldn't kick a ball straight. Couldn't throw a stone straight. Couldn't spit straight. Had none of the skills that make you something when you're a kid. I had none of them. But you know what? I was always last to be chosen. But God has chosen me. God has chosen you. Wherever you feel you come in the world's eyes, God has chosen you. And he says, because God has chosen you to carry his name, the people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. He goes on to say, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It's that simple. The Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. You mean if he did, yeah, even if he, what do you do? I must forgive that, yeah, you must forgive that too. I love when he says, make allowance for each other's faults. Make an allowance. Remember, you might have a couple of faults too. You may have a couple of annoying twitches or you may have a couple of ticks that annoy people. You may have some habits that annoy other people. So make allowance for their faults. And when you make allowance, when you count that into your calculation, what do you end up with? You end up with everyone being a winner. You're the one who actually ends up the peace by allowing for other people's weaknesses and faults. You're the one who ends up the winner. We all end up the winner where everyone's a winner, baby, because the person that you make allowance for doesn't get annoyed by you annoying them because you're annoying them, if you know what I'm saying. And when you make allowance for them, you benefit because you keep the peace that you have. And he goes on to say, allow, he says, you've got to forgive anyone who offends you. What? Forgive anyone who offends you? Yes, forgive anyone who offends you. They may be in your house, they may be in your home, they may be in your workplace, they may be in your car. Forgive anyone who offends you. Why? So that you will live as one of God's chosen people. You will be identified as somebody whom God has put his name upon if you live like this. No, this isn't easy, but we'll get to that in a second. He finishes off by saying, above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. It binds us all. He says, above all else, clothe yourselves with love and he uses this term clothe so many times in all of his letters he talks about clothing he talks about putting off your old nature and putting on your new nature and he talks about here about that we should clothe ourselves now none of us this morning were automatically dressed it says some of you aren't even dressed you're probably watching it in your whatever um so but you know, none of us automatically dressed this morning. Every one of us has agency. Every one of us got up this morning and made a choice about what to put on. Nobody got out of bed and said, oh, well, the clothes just like, they just came on me. Like, I mean, I, I didn't choose this. It was just on me. No, you chose what to wear. And he's saying we have the exact same choice. We can choose to clothe ourselves with love and compassion and kindness and humility, especially when we're living up close to personal people, when they're annoying us. What clothing are you wearing? Are you wearing the clothes of irritation? Are you wearing the jacket of jumpiness? I don't know what you're wearing. Are you wearing those things that annoy you? Or are you choosing to clothe yourself with patience and clothe yourself with love? We have agency, brothers and sisters. We have agency about the way that we should live. And here Paul says, bind them all together with love. Be loving. Love each other. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not seek its own, it rejoices when the truth wins out. All of these things, you know the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look it up and ask yourself, where do I measure up to that? Because that's the standard of love that Paul says. And he goes on to say, even if I'm like the most gifted guy in the world, even if I have incredible gifts and I can perform miracles and I give my body to the flames to be born and die as a martyr, but I haven't got love, I'm nothing, he says, nothing. It means nothing if I haven't got love. And here he says you need to clothe yourselves. Make the choice of love. And all the time he continually points through all of these things to the example of Jesus. And the example of Jesus is really, really important. 
Why is the example of Jesus really important? Because he is our standard. Paul actually goes on to say, follow my example as I follow Christ's example. Many of you will be familiar with the, the Christian movement. It's still kind of doing the rounds, but it was at its height maybe in the mid-90s. The WWJD movement. I had one of these bands here. I was wearing it for a couple of years. What would Jesus do was the question that was posed by this band. By, by these letters, the question was, what would Jesus do? That was the question. And you know, I often was really challenged by the question, what would Jesus do in every situation? What would Jesus do if he was being irritated by that person? What would Jesus do if he saw the need of that person? What would he do if he was in that situation? Well, I want to ask a slightly different question because I think the standard of Jesus, while it's incredibly high, is actually perhaps even too high because I think, well, what would Jesus do? Jesus formed a, a rope out of whips or formed a rope out of cords and he drove people out of the temple. I don't think uh, that it, we should all be doing that. For instance, he also, in, in one case, he addressed somebody almost in an off-handed way when he referred to somebody and said, you know, you shouldn't take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. You go, wow, Jesus, you shouldn't say that. And Jesus did some very, very strange things and things that you wouldn't have expected him to do. One of the reasons why they struggled with him so much. Much. And that standard, to me, when I was trying to live up to it, was just a little bit too high. I just found it too high. It is a good standard. It's a great example. Jesus sets the example. I want to ask a slightly lesser question. I want to ask a slightly different question, and it's about your identity. If you're in a situation, why not try asking yourself this question? What would a Christian do? What would a Christian do in my situation? How would a Christian respond, react in my situation? How would he do? You see, the thing about it is that we're now identifying with the identity that God has given us. I love it. In the current climate, we're talking about people who are choosing or self-identifying as something. I self-identify as a Christian. And therefore, I have to ask myself, what would a Christian do? Somebody was talking, just the other day, I was talking to somebody about praying. And they said, well, of course we pray. We're Christians. That's what Christians do. Christians give. Christians serve. Christians love. Christians forgive. People, Christians let things go. Christians should show compassion. We look at that, we say, what would a Christian do? The standard of Jesus is so high, but just ask yourself, what would a Christian do? Why? Because that's your identity. And we live into our identity. As I said on Tuesday week last, our identity is our purpose. Who we are determines what we do. Who we are determines what we do. I like this question that's asked in the business community. What is your why? What's your why? Because why you're doing something is tied to who you think you are. That's what it's tied to, your identity. And I'll tell you something, your identity is really, really important. And I'll tell you something more, the enemy is constantly, consistently attacking your identity as a Christian. He's constantly and consistently attacking your identity as somebody whom God loves and whom God has changed and whom God has made new. I like the idea when, when we look at identity and purpose that they're tied together. We do what we do because we are who we are. And to, I want to ask you to do something, even yourself at home today. Try this. Try, try living out your identity known. A known, for those of you who aren't native English speakers, is a person, a place, or a thing. In this case, we're talking about person. We're talking about identifier knowns. Here are some knowns that apply to me. This is what my life is like. Here are some knowns that I have to live out. I have to live out that of dad. I'm a father. So what, was a, what would a Christian father do? That's what I should be doing. That's the standard that I should be living up to. That's one of my identifier nouns. That's why I do what I do. I pray for my kids because I'm their dad. That's what I do. I help my kids. I support my kids. I feed and clothe my kids. Why? Because that's what a dad should do. I just live into that known. Here goes, here's another couple of classic ones. I'm a husband. No, my wife is in the background. So I'd be very, be very careful about what I say about how good a husband I am. I tell you something, I'm not a good husband. I'm like most men, most men, selfish. Because I think in my examination of the sexes, men are just more selfish than women. Would any of the women say amen? I think that will probably be your experience too. But as a husband, what does the scripture say? Husbands, love your wives. What does it say about dad's fathers? He says, do not exasperate your children by coming down hard on them. They're in Ephesians. Here about this one. What about as a brother? How am I living? As a spiritual brother and as a physical brother? Do I see a brother in need and just ignore his needs? Is that what I'm like? Because if that's what I like, I'm not living up to my identity known. I'm not living up to the standard that Jesus would have me live. Let me continue. As a son, well, as it turns out, uh, I, I, can't, I can't live up to the standards of a son because, uh, well, my parents are dead and I'm, I'm an orphan now. And my mammy and daddy, they're gone. 
I'm nobody's child. I'm nobody's child. I've got, my poor parents have passed away. Actually, somebody asked me a number of years ago, did they have much contact with my mother? And I said, really not much, to be honest with you, because she died 10 years ago. So I, we, we had a bit of fun over that. You know what, I, I can't identify with that, but perhaps you still have parents alive. Maybe you are a son. Maybe you've got Christian parents and you should obey them. What does the scripture say? Children, obey your parents for this is right. Would anybody say amen? Yeah, amen. Children, obey your parents. Do you hear me that? Unbelievable. What about as a friend? Am I a good friend? Am I somebody who looks up for my friends? Am I somebody who looks up to my friends? Am I somebody who looks after my friends? Am I a really good friend? Am I a good friend? You can challenge me on that. That's just fine. I know my friends out there writing and text me now saying, yeah, waste or you let me down. Anyway, that's one of my identifier names. And what about as a neighbor? What do my neighbors think of the way that I live? What do the neighbors think about the way that I carry this identifying down? I'm a neighbor and I'm a Christian. So therefore, how would a Christian neighbor respond? Would they ignore their neighbor's needs? Would they? And what about all these people that we end up living close and personal with? Our, our husbands and wives, our, our mothers and fathers, our sons our, and our daughters, our friends and our neighbours. We live up close and personal to those and those are all the people that can see what we are like and how we live. And it's to those that Paul continues on to address. It's to those situations that he continues on to address. Can I just offer you a little bit of homework? Try, the, try today. Write down your identifier nouns. It's really simple because some people, I don't know what God wants me to do. Are you a father? Yes, then he wants you to parent your children. Are you, are, are you, are you a friend? He wants you to be a friend to your friends. That's what he wants you to do. Are you a neighbor? He wants you to honor him by being a neighbor, a Christian neighbor to your neighbors. It's not mysterious what God wants you to do. I like he finishes off this passage in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 and he says this whatever you do or say do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through him to God the Father two things one do it as a representative in some other translations it says whatever you do in word or deed do it all in the name of Jesus. The reference in the name of Jesus was the same as doing it in the name of the emperor or doing it in the name of the king. Do it as a representative. You were representing the king or representing the emperor. You are now representing Jesus Christ. And he says, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Giving thanks is one of the most important single identifiers we can offer as Christians. Self-identifiers thank God publicly for his kindness and for his goodness and his blessing and his protection on their lives. That's what self-identifiers do. So I'm going to challenge you, will you self-identify? Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, my identifier nouns, one of my nouns is that I'm a drunk or I'm a waster or I'm an alcoholic or I'm a gambler or I'm a whatever. You, you fill in the blank. Do you know what? The enemy will consistently, constantly and continually want to rob you of your identity in Jesus Christ. He will continually want to rob you. He has continually wanted to rob mankind made in God's image of its identification as being a child of God. Remember, all efforts at genocide are always rooted in the simple idea of dehumanizing people. First they're dehumanized and then they're destroyed. And that is what the enemy's tactic has always been from the word go. He hates human beings. He hates mankind. Let me offer you a last verse and just something to remember. You know, we're living up close and personal right now. The other good news is that Jesus is living up close and personal to us. I know I've said a lot of things that can be maybe difficult to work out. We're going to look at those a little bit more on Tuesday night, but this is very important. The thing you can do, most important of all, while you're in lockdown or living in lockdown, while you're living up close and personal with others, is to stay close to the Lord. Here is what the psalm says. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He goes on to say, he grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and he rescues them. That's Psalm 145 verses 18 to 19. Take that in. So we get to our final part. I want to pray in just a moment because we've looked at ways that we can live with humility or the way we're challenged to live with humility and patience and kindness and gentleness and grace and mercy and forgiveness. That's all well and good. But how? The how is what we're going to turn our thoughts to on Tuesday night. If you tune in with us here on Tuesday night at half past seven, we'll be looking at the how we do that. How God has made us able to live in this way. 
it's very challenging. But I want to do a song. I want to do a worship song just before we close and pray. Before we pray and we close. I want to do a worship song and it's called Who You Say I Am. You're very familiar with it. It's been a song that's been doing the rounds for the last while. It's just an absolutely beautiful song. I'm not going to sing it all day and all night, but I'd like to sing it just for a moment. Let me just take a swig of water to wet my whistle because it's thirsty work all the singing and all the praying and all the talking. This is a song called Who I Am. And I want us to pray just as we do. I'm going to keep the prayer simple. I'm going to ask you, would you close your eyes where you are? Or would you stand even where you are? And we're going to pray really simply that God would enable us and remind us to live out our self-identity and his identity upon us as his chosen people. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you have chosen us and set us apart to be your people, to carry your name, Lord, that every one of us to whom you have given the identity of child or son or daughter of God, you have also given the purpose of carrying that identity, Lord. And it is in carrying that identity that we find our true purpose in life. Whether we are a father or mother, a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife, a friend, a neighbour, a work colleague, Lord. We pray, Lord, we would carry that identity and ask ourselves, what would a Christian do in our circumstances, Lord? I pray that we would keep before our minds that the identity you've given us is the most important identity that we will ever carry. Lord, I pray that you would empower us as we carry that identity, Lord. Help us to be gracious. Help us to be compassionate. Help us to be humble and forgiving. Help us to make allowance for the faults of others. And remember that we have faults of our own. And above all else, Lord, help us to remember that you have given us and called us to be your children. Lord, may we rejoice in that. May we remember that you're close by, ready to hear our cry, Abba Father. Who am I that the highest king should welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in of oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am, free at last he has ransomed me. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. From the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. My father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am. I'm 
Lord, I thank you that you have called us to be yours. You've put your name and stamp and identity on us. Help us to remember it. Help us to value ourselves as you value us. Help us to live out the name that we carry, Lord. Help us to live out our knowns well, even when we're up close and personal. I pray we would be patient with our children, patient with our husbands, patient with our wives, forgiving with our children, forgiving with our husbands, forgiving with our neighbours, forgiving with our friends. Lord, I ask you that you bless us as we go forward. And let us remember, Lord, that you are very close. Hear our prayer, hear our cry. In Jesus' name and God's people say, Amen. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. That's kind of us. For today don't forget we're going to be here on tuesday night. we're going to be looking at the next dimension we've looked at the what and the why on tuesday we're going to look at the how i hope you can join us i hope you can be here with us may god bless you and keep you watch over you and go with you in jesus name slong guys <laughs>